Hi everyone and welcome to primary knee arthroplasty section for the ABOS part one Borg review. My name is Vinay Agarwal and I'll be covering this topic for your Borg review course virtual section. So let's start with test taking strategies. So just to reiterate what some of the other speakers have said and to uh, directly borrow this from Dr. Roselle's talk just to be consistent, um, here are some steps you should take when you're doing the OITE or board's question. So read the last sentence of the question first and get a sense of what the, they're asking you for. Uh, try to look, try to make an answer choice without actually looking at the listed choices. And then you can look at the choices and select which one is the best. Now use imaging to confirm your answer choice and beware of superfluous information. The main difference, as uh, some of the other speakers have mentioned, between the ABOS Part 1 boards and the OITE is in the vagueness of the question. Uh, most of the ABOS questions, if not all, will have just a single answer choice that is best answering the question, whereas the OITE is a little sometimes more open-ended. Um, so just be aware that it's a little bit clearer on the boards. Let's get into the actual sections that we're going to cover here today. These are the most commonly tested topics and you'll notice that they're not all arthroplasty topics, uh, but they are the most common covered areas that you should focus on. So number one, non-operative management of knee arthritis. Number two, knee alignment and radiographic evaluation. Number three, knee kinematics and the surgical anatomy. Number four, non-total knee arthroplasty surgical options, so that includes osteotomies and such. Number five, total knee arthroplasty and balancing. This is going to be the bulk of what you should study for this section. Uh, it will present the most easy to get questions and the most number of questions. Number six, patella tracking and component rotation is probably the second most important that you should focus on from this section. We'll briefly cover number seven, TK design, and then finish up with number eight, complications, and then outcomes uh, as per some of the AOS guidelines. Now this little icon, the bomb icon, is listed on your slides here for things that are high yield. And this camera icon is things that you should commit to your memory. Again, borrowed from Dr. Roselle's talk just to be consistent. So let's start with non-operative management of knee arthritis. When you're assessing these patients, in general, on the test, they're gonna be greater than 45 years old obesity is going to be prevalent in them, and you should go through a differential on them. So are they patients with osteoarthritis? Is it a patient with rheumatoid or other inflammatory arthropathies? Uh, is it spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee or spunk? Is there a post-traumatic deformity from a prior tibial plateau fracture, for example? Are they hemophiliacs? Do they have concomitant gout or pseudogout? Um, and typically these patients will present with chronic pain or sometimes acute on chronic pain that's worse with activity, flexion, and weight bearing. On physical exam, you should look for the knee alignment when they're standing and really analyze their gait uh, with specific paying attention to their varus thrust. So varus thrust is when they go into uh, their stance phase. Their lat lat if they have medial knee OA, their lateral ligaments are stretched out. And as you can see from the diagram here, they go into a varus posture with weight bearing. So that's a varus thrust. Now location of the pain is extremely important evaluating question stems. So if it's an isolated compartment that's painful, that's important. Uh, ligamentous stability is very important when they tell you that on the exam portion. That includes varus valgus and anterior posterior sufficiency. Range of motion. Most common test question is going to be that the biggest predictor of post-total knee range of motion is the preoperative range of motion. That's been true for many decades now. And then lastly, we always do a neurovascular setting. So going into the published AOS guidelines on non-operative management, uh, there is strong evidence as well as some moderate evidence that, number one, a home exercise program should be recommended to all patients with knee osteoarthritis. Weight loss is highly recommended and do not use acupuncture or wedged insoles. There's inconclusive evidence for electrostimulation, for unloader braces, and for manual therapy such as chiropractors. Again, there's strong and moderate evidence that we should be using NSAIDs, as well as tramadol. That's a good one to remember. Tramadol is on the AOS guidelines as strong evidence to use for these patients. Do not use glucosamine and chondroitin. Do not recommend HA injections, although it's commonly used in the office practices of people. And do not obviously perform an arthroscopy or, levo or uh, needle aspiration for treatment. There's inconclusive evidence on Tylenol, opiates, and patches. 
Interestingly, inconclusive evidence on cortisone injections, something to remember, uh, even though it's commonly practiced, and obviously inconclusive evidence on arthroscopic meniscal treatment. Knee alignment radiographic evaluation. So we need to define the mechanical and anatomic axis, ax, uh, axes. So mechanical axes of the lower extremity is a plumb line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the tibia plafond. Uh, for the femur specifically, it's from the center of the femoral head to the center of the femoral condyles. And for the tibia specifically, it's from the center of the plateau to the several, uh, center of the plafond. Um, for the tibia, it's the same as anatomic. And you'll see that below here. So again, for the femur, the anatomic axis is a line that bisects the femoral canal, whereas for the tibia, it's a line that bisects the tibial canal. And again, this is the same in the tibia, anatomic and mechanical. Uh, this is a depiction of the coronal alignment. Commit this to memory. Um, mechanical axis labeled here from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. Um, and that has implications on your valgus cut angles, et cetera, that we'll get into in a second here. Um, and then the joint line is uh, labeled here three degrees off from the perpendicular to the mechanical axis. Again, we'll get into that in more specifics here. So here looking at uh, a diagram that you've probably seen before, uh, make note that the anatomic axis of the femur is in general 5 to 7 degrees valgus relative to the mechanical axis of the femur. Uh, so make sure you fully understand that concept. The tibia, as we mentioned, anatomic and mechanical are the same. And then understand this concept as well. The joint line naturally is in 3 degrees of varus. So that's reflected here in the medial proximal tibial angle of 87 and the lateral distal femoral angle of 87 as well. So let's talk about mechanical alignment versus kinematic or constitutional varus alignment. The main difference that you want to take home is that the joint line and mechanical act alignment is cut at zero degrees. Okay, so it's zero degrees in extension and flexion. Versus in kinematic alignment, you have your, you want to restore that three degrees of varus that we talked about, and the joint line as such in extension and flexion is cut so it's three degrees of varus. And those are reflected in the numbers that you can see on the slide. I won't go into too much detail on that. For the purpose of this test, focus on mechanical alignment. Now we're talking about definitions here. It's important to note three main definition and one number one is white sides line, which is the anterior posterior axis of the femur when it's flexed, so the lowest point of the trochlear groove, back to the PCL insertion. The TEA, which is the transepicondylar axis, which is defined as a line between the medial and lateral condyles. And then a posterior condylar line, which is just a line connecting the lowest points of the medial and lateral posterior condyles. The relationship of the posterior condylar axis is in general three degrees of internal rotation relative to the TEA. And the relationship of white sides to TEA is one of perpendicularity by definition. Now this is an interesting question that's come up on the OITs in the past. How does patient height affect our coronal alignment? Well, even though the hip offset stays relatively constant, the uh, valgus cut is uh, affected if a patient's taller, it's going to be less than 5 to 7 degrees, so more closer to 4 degrees. If the patient's shorter, it's going to be closer to 8 degrees of valgus. So that does affect your valgus cut angle to make your mechanical axis neutral. Why is sagittal alignment important? Well, it, on the femoral side, it affects your flexion extension of your uh, component, which has implications for uh, range of motion. And it also is important to look at your lateral, so you can see the posterior condylar offset as labeled here as X, which also has implications for flexion and impingement. On the tibial side, your slope of your proximal tibia is extremely important. Normal is 6 to 10 degrees posterior slope, and understand that anterior slope will prevent knee flexion. So when we're looking at radiographic evaluation of the knee. You always want to start with weight-bearing AP x-rays of the knee, um, and that's demonstrated here. If they're not weight-bearing, you don't get a great sense of the joint line. Uh, you can clearly see how the medial joint line closes down with weight-bearing. Standing alignment films are uh, 
controversial, but uh, in my practice, I find them extremely important. Um, they're especially useful for extremely short, tall, or tall patients or patients with preoperative deformity, uh, as they, uh, as you can see here. Uh, Weight-bearing x-rays, again, shown at the bottom right. You can see how the ligament on the lateral side is stretched out. You want to complete your films with a lateral view, a 45-degree PA flexion or Rosenberg view, and a sunrise or merchant view. Do not order MRI for knee arthritis um, uh, unless you're dealing with a young patient, some acute injury, uh, isolated chondral damage seen on x-ray, unclear physical exam regarding ligamentous sufficiency, and these are all particularly loose particularly useful when evaluating for unicompartmental knee arthroplasty or HTO. Well, let's move on to knee kinematics and the surgical anatomy. So our native knee has a differing articular geometry between the medial and lateral condyles. This is important. The medial condyle is a bigger one and it has a uniform radius of curvature. It is a more stationary condyle through the re range of motion of the knee. The lateral condyle has differing radiuses of curvature between the distal and the posterior condyle surfaces. Uh, this allows for the lateral condyle to roll back during knee flexion, which we'll show here. Femoral rollback is this concept and it's extremely important. There's a medial pivot point given the knee kinematics and as the knee flexes, the lateral condyle will rotate back posteriorly, almost falling back off of the posterior tibial articular surface. Now the screw hone mechanism has been tested many times and so it's important to understand that as the tibia, uh, sorry, as the knee goes into extension, the tibia externally rotates on the femur. You can look at this in a variety of ways, but that's the easiest way to remember uh, for me is X and X. I'll say it again, the knee flex it, sorry, the knee goes into extension, the tibia will externally rotate on the femur. This is vice versa for as the knee goes into flexion, the tibia will internally rotate on the femur. Either way you look at it, the lateral condyle is pivoting off of the posterior articular surface of the tibia as the knee goes into flexion, as you can see in this diagram here. Now looking at the knee for uh, total knee kinematics, you have to understand the joint line. Uh, the joint line is relative to uh, the medial epicondyle, 35 millimeters, 25 from the lateral epicondyle, and about 10 to 15 from the fibular head. Commit that to memory. Uh, tested question has been that when you do a total knee, you want to restore the joint line to 8 millimeters. Patella baja and patella alta are evaluated on the lateral x-ray with the insole savati ratios listed here. Uh, with the baja, you have raised the joint line and you will have difficulty exposing that knee. You'll have limited knee flexion and you should consider putting your patellar button superiorly um, or giving a distal femoral augment to lower the joint line. Vice versa is true with an alta, you have lowered the joint line and you're gonna have poor lever arm for your, knee, for your extension strength. Consider putting the button inferiorly on the patella here. This diagram again demonstrates the rollback phenomenon and when we're talking about total knee arthroplasty, trying to mimic the native knee kinematics, we've done a poor job of this with our implant designs. Um, it's thought to be due to sacrifice of the ACL, uh, which has really uncoupled that ACL-PCL link that helps drive that rollback. And so, especially with CR designs, you see a paradoxical rollback phenomenon, which is actually anterior sliding of the uh, femur on the tibia rather than a posterior rollback. Looking at surgical approaches, uh, very straightforward and simple for primary knees. Your workhorse, workhorse is going to be the medial parapatellar approach here listed. Uh, your midvastus is uh, preserving your extensor, but it denervates the VMO. And then your subvastus, which is rarely used, um, preserves your extensor, but it causes uh, additional hematoma. It's a little bit more difficult to expose. Lateral parapatellar not shown in this diagram, but severe valgus deformities people have described using it. Medial knee anatomy, you should be under understand where the structures lie. The superficial MCL inserts four to five centimeters distal to the joint line. The deep MCL, also known as a thickening of the joint capsule, is just below the joint line, directly medial, also known as a meniscal tibial ligament. 
medial structures that you are need to be familiar with that you can release are the deep MCL, superficial MCL, postmedial capsule, semimembranosus, and pes tendons. We'll get into that more when we're talking about the total knee balance. Again, commit this to memory, the lateral structure similarly. Popliteus unlocks the knee when it goes into flexion, externally rotates the femur relative to the, to the tibia, and that's, again, part of femoral rollback. So again, as you go into flexion, your femur is externally rotating relative to the tibia, or vice versa, when you go into extension, the tibia is externally rotating um, relative to the femur. Either way you want to memorize it, it's fine, but commit it to your memory. So let's talk about non-surgical, non-total knee arthroplasty surgical options. Knee preservation is likely going to be covered more in your sports lectures. However, uh, it's becoming more and more popular. Nonetheless, the literature on it is pretty early and not conclusive, and so it's unlikely to be tested in depth. But we'll just point out some of the available options here. It's going to be most likely for your age great, less than 40 and your athletic, healthy, low BMI patients. Your options that they're going to give you in the answer choices are microfracture, osteochondral allograft, osteochondral autologous transplant, and uh, MACI, or matrix autologous chondrocyte implantation. For the purpose of the test, and really in practice, do not pick microfracture. It's going to be a wrong choice. Uh, usually for knee preservation, it's going to be a contained defect less than 2 centimeters, and uh, performed concomitantly with a realignment osteotomy to offload the affected compartment. Speaking of knee osteotomies, uh, for specifically arthritis and not just a chondral defect, uh, there's limited evidence as per the AOS that a valgus producing osteotomy is beneficial for medial OA. The best indications to perform it are for your young, active, less than 45 patients. Uh, again, it has to be isolated compartment disease and symptoms. Uh, Better for high activity patients or if their occupation requires pounding on that joint. Um, and poor indications are older patients with significant deformity and especially smokers as you want to get that osteotomy to heal. Absolute contraindications are going to be your inflammatory arthritis patients, which you'll see is, an absolute, is a contraindication to uh, pretty much all procedures other than total joint arthroplasty. Uh, a lack of flexion, less than 90, a contracture, more than 10. Uh, ligamentous insufficiency. Uh, tibial, femoral tibial subluxation in either the coronal or the uh, sagittal planes, significant bone loss, or prior meniscectomy. Be aware of that in the contralateral compartment. You don't want to be doing an osteotomy. Speaking of HTOs, real quick, uh, valgus producing HTO is done on the tibial side, uh, most commonly an opening wedge due to the ease of access. Um, it does result in a patella baja often, and sometimes you can have a loss of correction or non-union. When you do a closing wedge on the lateral side of the tibia, it's technically more difficult. Again, can re result in a baja and a loss of your posterior slope. DFOs, distal femoral osteotomies, are for valgus knees, and you're producing it's varus producing. Uh, the Q angle, which is something we'll talk about later, is improved with the DFO, and so this has implications for patellar tracking and patellofemoral disease. With DFOs, the problems are non-union, loss of correction, and again, potentially residual maltracking. Unicompartmental knee arthroplasty. This is increasingly trending on tests to become the uh, correct answer, and that's because it's uh, um, becoming more reliable um, than HTO. Similar indications, however, for HTO, um, single compartment disease. The age is less important, and older patients might even have less revision rates um, than younger patients with U UKA. Again, contraindications are your inflammatory arthritis, your flexion, uh, fixed flexion deformity or slash contracture greater than 15 degrees, uh, 10 degrees of varus, 5 degrees of valgus. Again, be aware of meniscectomies in the contralateral compartment that they sneak into the test stem there. ACL insufficiency, which is an absolute contraindication for mobile bearing unis. And then patellofemoral disease is controversial, but for the purposes of the tests, um, anterior knee pain and patellofemoral disease, you kind of want to stick with the total knee. Complications after uni are uh, significant and plentiful. Uh, they include stress fracture, 
which is worse, uh, which is more common with patients with higher BMI and activity levels. It's usually always tibial sided. Look for a bloody aspirate and look for a sudden onset of a pain when patients have previously well functioning knees. There's going to be a higher incidence of implant loosening and subsidence in the unis, and disease progression can lead to a need for revision to a total knee. Implant wear and patellar impingement are present as well. Technical, these are technically more challenging operations than total knees, and so beware of overcorrection of the joint, over resection of the bone, or as you can see in this picture, malalignment of the components. Uh, the surgeon completely flipped around the femoral component, not being familiar with how a uni actually goes in. So uni versus osteotomy, some AOS guidelines. There are moderate evidence that there's no difference between uni and HTO for medial OA. So uh, that's the evidence out there. Uni, that being said, uni is a more reliable procedure as per the AOS guidelines. It has less short-term complications. Um, HCO is better for uh, laborers that have high activity as we talked about earlier. Now this is the, the crux of a lot of what they're going to be talking about and I uh, apologize I forgot to put the AOS logo on this slide as well but this is AOS guidelines. Uni has a faster recovery compared to both TK and HTO. Better knee kinematics compared to total knee which is tested. Shorter hospital stays and smaller incisions. Uh, there's a high short to midterm satisfaction for unis, but total knee arthroplasty is better long-term survivorship when measuring revision rates. Let's talk about uh, very briefly patellofemoral arthroplasty. Uh, these are uh, very uncommonly going to be tested, but it's for isolated patellofemoral disease uh, with 85% good to excellent outcomes. Again, contraindications include inflammatory disease. Uh, maltracking is uh, a contraindication to doing an isolated PFA. Uh, total knee is better and more reliable for your older patients with uh, patellofemoral disease. Don't pick patelectomy for that this kind of uh, com isolated compartment disease because of extensive, uh, significant extensor mechanism consequences. And then when we're talking about doing patella resurfacing in total knees, uh, there's been no difference in pain or fun function when you compare it to resurfacing versus not. However, what has been proven is that those who are not resurfaced, those total knees have a higher rate of revision. All right, so let's move on to the bulk of your uh, test questions here for this topic, and that's going to be with total knee arthroplasty and gap balancing. So let's talk about total knee gap, uh, total knee principles. So. Uh, ba gap balancing and measure resection are two ends of a spectrum. Uh, gap balancing being when you cut your bone to obtain symmetric rectangular gaps in extension and in flexion. And you ignore your ligamentous structures and deformities and you cut your bone so that you have perfectly equal gaps when you tension out those uh, ligaments with uh, uh, lamina spreaders as shown here in this diagram. Versus measure, measured resection is based on res, uh, restoring the presumed normal anatomy. Um, you take into account the exact thickness of your implant, and then you rotate your components based on some uh, presumed anatomic uh, normal uh, numbers. And then you do your ligamentous releases to obtain your uh, balance in extension and flexion. Now. In reality, this is a continuum, and all arthroplasty surgeons use a combination of the two in practice. So we're not just doing one or the other. Very rare instances, your gap balancers are going to be um, on one uh, end of, there's very few people that just do uh, it on the end of the spectrum. In reality, we use a variety of these techniques and kind of take into account both. For those of you that have uh, always been confused about what referencing means, anterior referencing systems is when you size your femur, your AP a a diameter of your femur, based on the anterior cortex of the femur and the posterior cut changes. So you have a fixed anterior slot and adjust your posterior slot to get the sizing and that's why the posterior uh, 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 aspect of the cut will change. Now, anterior referencing avoids notching. However, it can lead to variable flexion spaces. Vice versa, posterior referencing uses a fixed amount on the posterior condyles every single time. 
and it adjusts your anterior cut on the cortex uh, when you're sizing your femur. And so you can avoid over resection of the flem uh, flexion gap. However, you can lead to a significant anterior notching if you're not careful with a posterior referencing system. Now let's talk about our bony cuts in total knee arthroplasty. The order of the cuts is debatable. So femur first versus tibia first. I, I tend to do my distal femoral cut first, but that's a um, dealer's choice. What's important to commit to memory, this is something that you must, must, must know for the boards. And uh, re really upon graduation, you, you should know this in general. The tibial cut affects both extension and flexion. The distal femoral cut ex affects only your extension space and then your posterior femoral cut affects only your flexion space. There's a variety of structures that might affect the spaces, uh, soft tissue structures that also might affect the spaces um, listed here. In general, your anterior femoral cut is most important to, uh, for notching and then your patellar femoral joint stuffing. So let's start with a distal femoral cut. So it's a val the valgus cut angle is determined from preoperative x-rays, and that's only if you have standing long leg films. And I tend to measure this on all my patients uh, from the center of the femoral head to the, um, uh, the center of the notch and then up the axis of the femur. So it's difference of your anatomic and mechanical axis. That will give you a perpendicular cut to your mechanical axis. Most people, it's six degrees. When you do your proximal tibial cut, you're going to do a perpendicular cut to the long axis, anatomic or mechanical, they're equal. Again, it's going to be zero degrees to get a mechanical alignment in total knee. Balancing. Let's talk about sagittal and coronal planes. In the sagittal plane, your extension space must equal your flexion space by the end of the knee. In the coronal plane, your medial and lateral spaces must, must match. And rules of thumb are that you want to release soft tissue on the concave side of the deformity, whether we're talking about coronal or sagittal deformities. If it's a symmetric problem, in general, you're going to adjust the tibia. And if it's an asymmetric problem, in general, you're going to do something to the femur. So here's uh, uh, the chart that we've all seen about our extension and flexion space balancing. And this is something you absolutely must know for the boards. Uh, you want to know this inside and out, and whether you memorize it or more preferably understand it so that you can work your way through the question stem, one way or another you have to know this. So when we're talking about our flexion and extension spaces, here on the left you can see the flexion space, and it's effect affected by our, our posterior femur and our proximal tibia. Um, and on the right you can see the extension space affected by our distal femur and our proximal tibia. So going through this chart, well, let's do a sagittal gap balancing exercise. Let's start with tight and extension, tight and flexion. It's a symmetric problem. We're going to move to the tibia and we're going to cut more tibia as we're tight. Vice versa, we're loose in extension, loose in flexion. Again, a symmetric problem. We're going to go to the tibia and add thickness to our tibial implant with mud augment or just increase the poly thickness. When we're talking about being tight in extension but balanced in flexion, we want to start by removing posterior osteophytes. That's not commonly talked about, but it is going to tent your extension. Next, you want to release posterior capsule uh, for mild deformities up to 10 to 15 degrees. If you have significant uh, flex tight tightness in extension, you're going to have to cut more distal femur. Now, beware that cutting more distal femur comes with a price. But in general, every two millimeter bone resected gives you 10 degree uh, extra correction. And that's been a test question in the past. Sad, uh, going to uh, loose in extension but balanced in flexion, um, you're going to either add distal femoral augments or you're going to add poly thickness and then downsize the femur. So number two is a combo. They're usually not going to ask you on the test to do a combo. It gets a little complicated. So just understand. Um, that you're going to have to add distal femoral augments, which is not practical in a primary knee setting. So in a primary knee setting, you're going to do number two here. So when we're talking about being balanced in extension but tight in flexion, there's a number of steps that you can take. The first thing you should, you should check with your uh, implant is it a CR knee and is the trial lifting off. 
If the insert is lifting off, you can release or recess the PCL in a graduated fashion, and this is going to increase your flexion space without affecting too much more. And you can just balance the knee with that. Number two, when you when you finish doing that, you might need to check your tibial slope because uh, if you don't have enough tibial slope or if you have anterior slope, you're going to be really tight in flexion, and you need to address that before you do anything else. Now, if all else fails, you will have to downsize the femoral component by cutting more posterior femur. And uh, it's listed in some of the charts, but uh, I don't think uh, it has too much of an effect, but releasing posterior capsule is the last step. Now, when we're talking about being balanced in extension but loose in flexion, you're going to have to upsize the femoral component. Or you're going to have to posteriorize the femoral component. Both things will, in effect, um, decrease the amount of space in flexion and fill up that flexion space. When you posteriorize a femur, however, be careful of notching. And you might have to use posterior augments or cement to fill in that space. Talking about being tight in extension but loose in flexion, so we have an opposites problem here. You're going to have to do two things, cut distal femur and you're going to have to upsize or posteriorize the femoral component. And then lastly, when you're talking about being loose in extension but tight in flexion, you're going to have to downsize the femoral component and adjust the tibial height until it's balanced. So you're going to increase the poly thickness until it's balanced. So the, ace, the opposite problems, the last two slides here, are going to be your hard ones and your tricky ones on the test. So beware of those. Now a couple of technical considerations. These are what I talked about when the trial lifts off in a CR implant with knee flexion. You can recess the PCL in a graduated fashion. And then checking your posterior slope of the tibia is super important. So uh, with a CR implant, um, you want to match the normal posterior slope 6 to 10 degrees um, with a PS implant closer uh, between 0 and 5 degrees. Um, moving on to uh, coronal gap balancing, we're going to be talking about releases here. The rule of thumb, like I said earlier, was you want to release the soft tissue on the concave side. That's extremely important to understand, and don't get confused by that. It makes intuitive sense, but just understand that. So for a varus knee, you're going to do medial releases. And that always, always, always begins with osteophytes. That's a test question in the past. After you've done your osteophyte, then you can move on to your deep MCL, which is going to be closer to your joint line around the medial side. As you release around the medial side of the tibia into the back, you're going to get to the posterior medial corner, which is capsule and semimembranosis. Uh, then you can do uh, pie crusting, or if you're Norm Scott, full release of the superficial MCL. It's important to understand for the test, they're going to ask you about the different parts of the superficial MCL. So posterior structures of the knee affect extension preferentially, and anterior structures in the knee affect flexions uh, preferentially. Lastly, you can go to the pes tendons, and then you can do something called a reduction osteotomy of the tibia, where you, uh, it's a technical thing, I haven't seen it tested, but just so you know, you downsize the, the tibial tray size, lateralize it as much as possible, and just chop off as much medial tibia that's remaining that's tenting on the MCL. Moving on to the lateral side, again, you're going to do lateral release for a valgus knee. You're going to start with a minimal medial release for exposure, that's important, and then you're going to go to your osteophytes. After you've done, dealt with your osteophytes, you're going to do posterior capsular release, which is better for extension, again, a posterior structure. Your IT band is better for extension for the test. Your popliteus is better for flexion for a test. Again, these are test topics. I don't think in practice they're necessarily super applicable, but uh, for the test, know what they are looking for, preferential release. Um, lastly, your LCL can affect both flexion and extension, and it should be the last thing you release. Now, when we're talking about uh, posterior releases for a flexion contracture of the knee, uh, you're going to start with posterior osteophytes, as I talked about, then the capsule, and lastly, and very, very rarely, the gastrox. The rule for deformity is that greater or equal than 20 degrees and very close to the joint line is going to require uh, of uh, osteotomy in addition to total knee. So you're not going to be able to correct the deformity with the total knee alone. 
the further you move away from the joint and the smaller the deformity, you can really correct those just by doing a total knee. When you do your correction, when you do your correction through the joint, you really want to be careful that you're not chopping off bone that has insertion sites for your ligament ligaments on uh, either side of the knee. Let's move on to patellar tracking and component rotation. So we talked about Q-angle before, but the official definition of Q-angle is going to be the line between the quad tendon and the line bisecting the patella tendon. An increasing value for Q-angle will lead to maltracking, especially worse with prosthetic components. And so valgus knees should really be restored to their neutral mechanical axis in order to decrease that Q-angle force. There's a lot of different ways to judge your femoral rotation. Many famous people have published about this. In real life, we use a combination of these tools. Uh, understand that the AP axis of the femur from the lowest point of the trochlea to the uh, posterior uh, groove is called the Whitesides line. John Insel used the epicondylar axis. Uh, we can use the posterior condylar axis and set our jig to three degrees of internal rotation if we're doing a measured resection technique. Dick Scott used the tibial cut to balance his femoral cut, making it parallel in 90 degrees of flexion. And then a pure gap balancing technique uses tensiometers uh, and rotates your femoral cut to be parallel to your tibial cut. When we're talking about uh, measured resection technique, if the joint line is in three degrees of varus, uh, then you want to rotate your femoral component externally by a slight amount, three to five degrees typically, to get that rectangular gap as can be seen here. Special considerations when we're dealing with the femoral component Valgus knees with severe lateral wear, particularly on that posterior femoral condyle, can have hypoplasia. And therefore, when you're sizing your femur and setting your rotation, it can cause internal rotation of that femoral component. And remember, internal rotation is bad. Why? It causes lateral patellar subluxation, and then you end up with a tight medial side and a loose lateral side, as you can see on this diagram. And this is a cause for later revision due to stiffness or instability. When we're talking about tibial rotation, you really want to define your AP axis as the medial third of the tubercle back to that PCL insertion on the tibia, and your tibial component wants to be in line with that. If you internally rotate your tibial component, that's going to be a relative external rotation of that tubercle. And so what you have is a resulting increase in that Q angle we talked about. Increase in Q angle is bad, leads to patellar maltracking, and you can view that in this picture here. So this is a favorite question of the, the test makers for the OITE and the boards. Anything, uh, any of the listed here will lead to maltracking. So you do not want to internally rotate either your femoral tibial components. You do not want to medialize your femoral tibial components and you do not want to lateralize your button on the patella. Just let that sink in for a little bit. Work through these uh, scenarios in your head, but any of these listed will lead to lateral subluxation of the tibial of the patellar component. Now, when your patella is maltracking, one time they did ask uh, what the next step in management should be, and uh, tourniquet deflation is important because the quad mechanism can be affected by the tourniquet. So you want to retract after the tourniquet's down. Uh, the patellofemoral thickness is important because it can tent those lateral retinacular structures if it's overstuffed and lead to a false sense of maltracking. Uh, evaluation of maltracking includes a patellofemoral view x-ray, um, a lateral view x-ray, as well as CT scan for rotational assessment of your femoral tibial components. Let's go through TKA design very briefly. This is something that you guys probably haven't had a, a lecture on, um, but is important. The AOS uh, guidelines point out that there's no difference in outcomes between PS and CR designs. Um, and there's no difference in outcomes between all polytibias and modular tibial designs. So all polytibias uh, have kind of gone by the wayside. 
but they are extremely reliable and have great results, so there's no difference in outcomes. But the modular tibias you've seen on the bottom right here is what our workhorse is in 2020. Modularity is used because it gives us flexibility intra-op and both post-op if you ever have to do a liner exchange. However, there is an increase in backside wear and osteolysis uh, with uh, modular designs. Again, with newer locking mechanisms and polyethylene processing, this wear pro problem has really fallen off as well. So starting with CR implants, obviously you leave your PCL intact and this helps to regulate your flexion space and in theory it controls your rollback. The advantages are obviously it's bone conserving and there's proprioceptive feedback from that PCL. There's more consistent joint line restoration and like we talked about the flexion gap is nice and tight. You don't have that mid flexion instability. The ACL coupling with the PCL that's been disrupted when you take out the ACL. So PS knees, the advantages are that it's easier to balance and you have a cam post mechanism that controls that rollback better. But the disadvantages are that you are taking more bone out of the box, increasing the risk for fracture. You do have a looser flexion gap because you're taking that PCL and it can lead to knee dislocation if you don't balance it properly. So the knee can dislocate when the cam jumps the post as seen here. Um, your flexion gap could be worsened if you over-release your popliteus, uh, your femoral condyles, or this MCL insertion. Now to reduce this knee, you want to give the patient general anesthesia, so relax them and take them out of spasm. You're going to go to 90 degrees of knee flexion. Dis the disadvantages of a PS, we talked about it, but in addition to uh, taking out bone, you have this risk of poly wear from, or fracture on the post. Uh, this is exacerbated when the knee hyperextends and hits the box. So anything that flexes the femur, um, it increases posterior slope on that tibia, or if you move your tibial component anteriorly, will worsen the fracturing or wear of that anterior post, as you can see here. And this can lead to osteolysis. Patella clunk is an important thing to define and for you to be aware of. So it's specifically restricted to a PS implant, that's number one. It's the scar tissue superior to the component that's on the undersurface of the quad. And that scar tissue gets caught in the box as the knee goes from flexion to extension. The scar catches and releases as you go past the uh, pivot point into full extension and that usually happens at 30 to 40 degrees. And, and you want to prevent this by uh, really getting that synovium superior to the patella out before uh, you finish your total knee. Risk factors for patellar clunk are uh, anything that increases the force in the quad. So they like asking this question, the small patella implant, a thin thickness, uh, a patellar baja, which is going to lower your um, patellar component down to that box, um, increased posterior condylar offset, and multiple previous surgeries. Uh, this is something you kind of have to commit to memory. The treatment for uh, clunk can be either arthroscopic or open. Either are acceptable for the test, and you want to really get rid of the scar tissue. Let's talk about very briefly about rotating platform or uh, mobile bearing design total knee. Um, the liner rotates on a flat, polished metallic base plate, and there's better articular conformity throughout the knee range of motion. However, on all studies, there's been equal equal survivorship to fixed bearing total knees. The main disadvantage of a rotating platform design is the disassociation of the mobile bearing. And you will see this on x-ray as the liner spins out and the shadow of the polyethylene can be seen laying outside of the normal tibial femoral articulation. Very quickly talking about constraint, there's no change in constraint uh, from a CR to a PS. It does not add varus valgus constraint as you can see on the bottom image here. However, the next level of constraint is going to be your high post, with the, which is uh, varus valgus and some rotational constraint. Next, you're going to have a hinge with a rotating platform. Um, 
which is linking the femur and the tibia. And then lastly, which we don't use, is a uniplanar hinge, which doesn't give any rotation. There's too much torque on the cement bone interface there with a uniplanar hinge, and those have gone by the wayside. Your indications for a high post varus valgus constraint are uh, MCL attenuation, an LCL deficiency, or a relative MCL deficiency. Charcot joint as well as residual flexion gap laxity can be treated with uh, varus valgus high post. However, you really want to leave the OR with a balanced flexion extension gap um, in the first place. Indications for hinge are anytime they use the word global in the test answer or test question stem, um, that's going to be an uh, hinge as the answer choice. Um, hyperextension is definitely going to be treated with a hinge. So somebody who's post polio, if they say, or has had capsular disruption in the back, um, for ligament insufficiency or dislocation, the answer choice automatically is going to be hinge. Let's finish up with complications as well as outcomes of TKA. We'll just go into this briefly as uh, Dr. Slover is going to cover revision TKA uh, in depth. But I thought I'd point out some of the AOS uh, guidelines on outcomes uh, and miscellaneous topics here. So patella fracture is tested, stiffness is tested, neurovascular injury, soft tissue injury including MCL and extensors, metal allergy tends to be tested. Uh, periprosthetic fracture, aseptic loosening, and PJI will most likely be covered uh, in depth by Dr. Slover in the revision total knee talk. Patella fracture, usually due to over resection of bone with the minimum thickness that you want to leave them with, 13 millimeters. AVN is also a risk factor for patellar uh, fracture, uh, so you want to preserve the vascular supply to the patella. Loosening of the patella can lead to a repetitive abrasion and osteolysis that can ultimately lead to fracture. If you do have a fracture, it's a little bit of a complex treatment algorithm. If the patient has minimal lag and the component is stable, you can just cast them. And that's probably the best thing for the patient. If they have a significant lag and the total knee looks stable, um, you want to assess for whether the component is loose or not. So if the patella is loose, and there's no bone stock left, you're going to have to remove the button. You might need to do a patellectomy if there's significant fragmentation of the fractures. Um, and then you want to suture the bone and tissue in an imbrication fashion, plus minus using an allograft or mesh. If the patella is loose and there is bone stock, you might be able to do a button exchange. Um, but that's not really advocated in real life. Uh, you do want to remove some of the small chiclets uh, of bone and then you're going to repair the tendon in the same fashion as listed above with an allograft or a mesh. Uh, if there is an unstable total knee prosthesis, you're going to have to revise the total knee. Let's talk about stiffness. Usually it's uh, when the knee does not flex past 70 to 80 degrees and it's uh, treated initially very early on with aggressive physical therapy and it's thought to be due to hamstring tightness. Uh, unless there's something technical that was done incorrectly in the, in the original knee. Manipulation only works up to 12 weeks, um, and after that there's a high rate of supracondyl or femur fracture. Um, after 12 weeks, stiffness is a really big problem with no good solution. Uh, the, the results of open synovectomy and liner uh, thickness decrease is really poorly uh, tolerated and, and does, is not recommended. Um, a revision total knee should be undertaken if stiffness is thought to be presum presumed due to component malrotation or positioning. So you always want to do a thorough alignment check, component check, and rotation check um, with CT scan, etc. before going to a revision total knee, especially for stiffness. When we're talking about neurovascular injury, perineal nerve is most commonly injured in a valgin valgus flexion deformity. So patients who are both valgus and flexion, if they don't have a deformity, the most common reason is an aberrant retractor placed in the lateral side of the knee. Other risk factors for perineal nerve palsy are, are epidural anesthesia, tourniquet time greater than two hours, local infiltrate, um, or a preoperative neuropathy. The management of nerve palsy, first step, remove the compressive bandages and flex the knee in the recovery room. Support the foot with an AFO for the short-term, midterm, 
Um, by three months, they should resolve, and if they haven't, you can do an EMG study and do a decompression. And when talking about arterial injury, popliteal artery sits directly behind the posterior capsule at the PCL insertion. Uh, you want to call for vascular right away, flex the knee, remove implants if possible, and inflate the tourniquet. Now, importantly, we talked about patellar vascularity earlier. The diagram on the right shows that. When you do a medial arthrotomy, you're taking out the medial supply to patella, and all you're left with is the lateral supply. If you are doing an infrapatellar fat pad removal, that only leaves you with the superior lateral geniculate artery. So you really have to preserve that artery or else you're going to leave yourself with an avascular patella. This can be injured during aggressive lateral retinacular release. When we're talking about soft tissue injury, there's two things you want to focus on the MCL. You can either do a primary repair in the uh, index total knee um, and then uh, brace the patient for six weeks using a um, constraint device if needed. Um, or you can just convert them to a high post, um, not a PS if it's significant. Extensor mechanism injuries are, the ca are catastrophic in total knee arthroplasty. Never do a direct repair or non-operative treatment. This requires a reconstruction of some sort, whether it's an uh, allograft or a mesh reconstruction. You always want to rule, rule out PJI in, in any of these patients first. Metal allergy is debated on whether this is a real thing or not, but certainly the test loves this. It's a less than 1% incidence, and nickel is thought to be the offending agent. Type 4 delayed hypersensitivity reaction that's T-cell, T-lymphocyte mediated. Uh, importantly, never choose skin patch testing. It has no correlation. Uh, what you do want to choose on the test is lymphocyte T-cell proliferation test. It's always a diagnosis of exclusion, however, and you want to rule out everything else as the reason for their pain prior to revising a patient to a nickel-free implant. Periprosthetic fracture, uh, again, Dr. Slover will probably cover this in more detail, but in general, uh, the femur, uh, if the implant's loose, you want to revise the total knee um, and do a plus minus uh, open reduction internal fixation. Or if the patient, this is a, important for the test, is elderly, sick, or osteoporotic, you can get in and get out with a distal femoral replacement uh, very easily and not limit their weight bearing, et cetera, and it's a much more reliable recovery for that patient. Uh, if the implant is stable, you're going to choose between a locked plate and a retrograde nail. Locked plating, submuscular approach with minimal invasiveness is the preferred answer choice. You can only use a retrograde nail if you have a CR implant or a box that allows it. Intraoperatively, they're going to ask you what's the most common fracture. It's the femoral condyle, specifically on the medial side. And it happens with PS designs. Obviously, as you're taking more bone for that box, you have uh, less bone to work with. Let's go through the guidelines now on the AOS recommendations for outcomes. So there's strong evidence that obesity leads to worse outcomes after total knee and increased complications. There's moderate evidence that diabetes and chronic pain lead to worse outcomes and increased complications. And there's limited evidence that cirrhosis, hepatitis C, as well as depression and anxiety lead to worse outcomes. There's strong evidence that TXA decreases blood loss and the need for transfusion. And there's moderate evidence that there, an eight-month delay to total need does not worsen outcomes. In general, spinal or epidural anesthesia is uh, preferred as it leads to improved outcomes and lower complications compared to general anesthesia. There is limited evidence that pre-op PT might help with uh, post-op pain and function. Bilateral total knee is good as, part, as far as the AOS is concerned in younger than 70 years old and ASA 1 or 2. Tourniquet use is a hot topic right now and always has been. However, um, in general, there's an increased short-term pain, decreased intraoperative blood loss, and decreased short-term function. So the best survival for total knees is in a well-balanced total knee with neutral mechanical alignment. Interestingly, women greater than 70 years old, low activity uh, levels, counterintuitive is rheumatoid arthritis is better than osteoarthritis for survival. Um, and um, you can see the decreased survival risk factors there. 
Talking about anesthesia, there's decreased need for post-op opiates with a PAI or the local infiltrate cocktail that we do, as well as with a peripheral nerve block. Now it's debated whether adductor canal block or peripheral, uh, sorry, periarticular local injection is better. But what is clear is that adductor canal is better than femoral nerve block. Tourniquet use, uh, one more time, uh, we talked about that actually. Bone cement, um, you should not be using antibiotic bone cement routinely. Um, cement and cementless knees, which they're going to ask more and more about, perform equal to each other in studies. Um, and that's been shown in a variety of AOS recommendations, as you can see here. Um, do not use, as per the AOS, drains, CPM, or cryotherapy devices unless you want to pay a, um, a pretty penny here. You can rent, you can still rent CPM devices for $2,500 if you're interested, um, but don't choose it on the boards. Physical therapy and rehab, you want to start it on post op day zero, and that will improve our pain function and decrease length of stay. Um, therapy is uh, still considered helpful as far as AOS guidelines go for the test. Last slide, we're going to finish up with uh, navigation and robotics. So uh, again, a lot of this is used in practice, but as far as evidence for the AOS goes, it's only coming out now, so it could be testable for you guys. Navigation, there's strong evidence that you should not utilize this because there's no difference in outcomes or complications. Um, however, the literature does suggest that this might lead to more precise cuts, but no translation to clinical benefit. And then PSI, patient-specific instrumentation, again, do not use because it has no difference in pain, function, or complication rates. So that ends this section. Again, just to summarize one more time, read the last sentence of the question first, get a sense of what they're asking for, try to answer without looking at the choices, and use the imaging to confirm your choice be aware of superfluous information. Uh, it's a lot of information that we covered in a short amount of time. Uh, I think, like I said, uh, topics about balancing and topics about femoral uh, patellar maltracking and femoral rotation are going to be the most important to understand. Uh, going through that chart of gap balancing is going to be the key, and I'm happy to review that with you guys on an individual basis. Uh, try to work yourself through that so you actually understand it. Uh, rather than just memorize it. That's going to be helpful when they present the stems for the questions. These are just some materials that helped, uh, including the Millers and AOS board reviews, hipandkneebook.com, amongst other site, cited material. Thank you guys, and good luck on your tests. Uh, please let reach out to me if you have any questions.